What is going on, everybody? This is another episode of the I Test Takes podcast. This is going to be episode 19, uh, where I'm going to recap the divisional round of the playoffs as well as preview uh, the championship weekend of the NFL playoffs. Um, I'm also going to get into a little bit of uh, head coaching hires that happened this past weekend and early on in this week. Um, a little bit of rumors, obviously, hires there. Um, but yeah, let's just jump right into it. I'm going to start with some of the, the hires of the weekend and of this early week and some of the rumors flying around as well on some other vacancies. Uh, just to start, let's go with uh, Brandon Staley, uh, the defensive coordinator for the L.A. Rams, uh, who just recently lost, obviously, to the Green Bay Packers. Um, he's going to be the new head coach of the L.A. Chargers. Um, seems like a pretty simple and easy transition for him. Obviously, he's going to get to stay in L.A., going to play in the exact same stadium. Um, but he has been a awesome defensive coordinator all of this season. This is literally his first season as a defensive coordinator underneath uh, Sean McVay, obviously. Um, and he has turned that Rams defense, which seemed to be kind of a, a little bit more of a middle of the road defense last year. Uh, and he has made them the number one defense in all of football. And he was rewarded by it, by getting a head coaching job. Um, obviously the Chargers job is a very attractive job at this point with, uh, uh, Justin Herbert playing so well, uh, th- there's a lot of very good pieces there in LA. It was literally just more of a, uh, management slash head coaching, you know, deficiency there in, in LA for the Chargers that was making that team just not a, a very good team in general. Um, so they're going to get a guy that from reports I'm hearing is people are kind of comparing uh, Brandon Staley as being a kind of a, a Belichick type where he actually played offense like in his actual career um, as a football player and he actually went and kind of transferred over to the defensive side to coach. Uh, and so he really has that nice balance of, of knowing both sides of the ball, kind of like Belichick does. Um, and so, yeah, people were really, you know, hot on his trail after the fact that, you know, the, the Rams ended up losing. So they got right in there and the Chargers swept Brandon Staley right up and he's going to be the new head coach there. Uh, moving right on to Arthur Smith, former offensive coordinator for the Tennessee Titans. He's going to be, he interviewed with quite a few teams, including my Eagles. Um, he's going to be the new head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. That team, um, I would say they're a pretty attractive spot just because of basically the division. Um, the NFC, I, I don't think is just as, as tough as the AFC is at this point in time. Um, I mean, you got some good pieces in place in Atlanta. The defense is lacking a little bit. Uh, I don't know what they're still going to do with Julio Jones in the offseason. You know, there's been talk about him and even Matt Ryan, uh, like the team in general, moving on from them. But maybe with this hire of Arthur Smith, which is an offensive guy, uh, they might consider uh, keeping them on just to see how that would, you know, mesh uh, and see if they, he can kind of turn them around, uh, being that he's a offensive, you know, minded head coach. Um, that I think is probably going to be a decent fit. Um, so I expect the Falcons to be better than they were last year. I mean, just, I mean, Quinn was just a wreck there after the the whole Super Bowl run and everything. Basically once Kyle Shanahan left that organization, it was downhill from there for the Atlanta Falcons, especially on offense. And then the next is going to be Robert Sala to the New York Giants, New York Jets, sorry, not Giants. New York Jets, and I think this is literally going to be like one of the better hires of the offseason. I just think, and this is like, I don't even really have reasons for this, but just Robert Sala looks like he should be the head coach of the New York Jets. He's just like, he kind of looks like a New Jersey meathead a little bit. He's a little bit jack, can sit like for just kind of for no reason. Uh, he looks like he's super intense. Uh, you know, I, I just like the way he looks as a leader. Uh, and a head coach candidate. I mean, I think that's going to be a great fit. That Jets defense has some some pretty decent pieces on it, and they played better as the season went on. Um, and then I really think it, I think it's just going to depend on who all he brings on his staff. Um, but if you know some of the inklings we've heard is like a, a Mike McDaniel uh, that he could be stealing from the San Francisco 49ers um, and make him like an OC. 
or even uh, I think it's uh, Matt LaFleur's brother. I can't remember what his first name is, uh, but he's also another guy that's been, you know, hot on some, you know, some people's lists when it comes to like possible offensive coordinators and stuff like that. Uh, so I think it's really going to come down to whoever he puts on his, you know, offensive coordinator position. Uh, if they're going to be able to, I don't know, they have the decision to make, obviously, uh, of trying to stick with Sam Darnold or draft somebody number two overall. Uh, but I think they might actually try to stick with Sam Darnold and trade back in the draft and get more draft capital and just really get a team built out of young, great talent. Uh, especially coming out of this draft, which it's pretty, it's pretty deep with talent this year. Um, that's pretty much all I got for this Robert Sala. I just think he's that's going to be a, a great fit. Uh, then Urban Meyer to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, I'm not as high on this hire. Um, I really would like to like this job or like this this hire, this fit, um, because I really want. Trevor Lawrence to step right in because I I assume Trevor Lawrence is going to go number one overall to the Jacksonville Jaguars. I really want Trevor Lawrence to step right into the NFL with a good, uh, you know, head coach, good offensive coordinator, just a, a good system in general, just so we get to see his full talent on full display. Um, but for me, I don't know what, and maybe it's just like the fact that I'm a little bit biased considering I'm an Eagles fan. We had the whole Chip Kelly era. They are not the same type of head coach in general. I know this, but it's just that going from college to the NFL, it's a big jump, and I don't. Not every one of them obviously makes it. Uh, there's been some great ones that jump from college, um, but I don't know if I'm super sold on Urban Meyer just yet, and just how sketchy he's been in the last few years with a whole lot of controversy and, and scandal with stuff that happened at Ohio State. Obviously, his time in Florida was was very good, like successfully, like. With record wise, championships wise, but obviously they've had some crazy, you know, stuff going on there as well. So I just I have to see it to believe it with the Urban Meyer uh, fit. Um, but obviously that is one of the more, more attractive jobs in you know the NFL head coaching vacancy this this off season because of the factor of getting Trevor Lawrence, the cap space they have, uh, the draft capital they already have. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how that team comes full circle if they do, and I hope they can. I'm not really rooting against Urban Meyer being a flop, but I just have a feeling it might end up being one. Um, and then we're going to go on, and I'm going to talk about the Eagles and the Texans. Those are the two teams left, basically, uh, in the head coaching vacancy you know, pool. Um, the Eagles, man, especially for, obviously, I'm watching everything Eagles I can right now because that's my team. That's just what I do. And it is it, it's exhausting, like the amount of people that they're bringing in, and I'm I'm obviously not even part of the process. It's just exhausting reading how many people are on the list of of interviewees uh, for this head coaching job, and I don't know if that's because they just really want to do their due diligence. I really hope that's why, or if they're like kind of in panic mode because they got you know into the head coaching you know searching a week late because of the whole debacle with. Doug Peterson having the first meeting, and I think they expected him to be back. But then when they had the second meeting down in Florida with Jeffrey Lurie, the owner, um, he came back with a very lackluster group of, of coaches that he wanted to bring in after the season, and, or actually retain more or less. And at that point, Jeffrey Lurie was like, we got we to gotta go in a different direction here. So I don't know why their you know search for head coaches has been so expansive. Um, but the latest and hottest uh, name right now connected to the Eagles has been Josh McDaniels, and I think I have talked myself into thinking that is going to be a good hire if that is what happens. Uh, he's obviously had his – he has his baggage. He's had his failures in the past, um, but at the same time, I think maybe he has learned uh, since then from all those experiences. Uh, obviously, you know, been under the tutelage of Bill Belichick, the greatest coach of all time. Um, so I, and he's obviously an offensive minded guy, worked well with quarterbacks, developed quarterbacks. I mean, he's coached Tom Brady, Jimmy Garoppolo, um, Jacoby Brissett, all those guys. He had Matt Castle playing well, all, all of this in totality. I just think it's probably a solid fit for the Eagles. Um, and if it ends up being a disaster because the reports coming out right now is the fact that Howie Roseman is on board with the Josh McDaniels hire. Um, but Jeffrey Lurie still kind of needs some convincing. Um, so actually, if 
is it could be a you know a win win here where if Josh McDaniels comes in and he's awesome and we win football games and you know we win championships whatever amazing if he comes in and it's, and it's a disaster. And Howie Roseman is the one that vouched for him. Maybe at that point, Howie Roseman gets kicked out of the door as, as well as Josh McDaniels if it just goes completely south. So that's where I'm at with that. Um, I really, ha- I'm going to be completely honest. I haven't really kept up with you know the Texans search for coach. I think Josh McDaniels was kind of sp- like spilled into, sprinkled into their their search as well. Um, they've had a few other you know candidates. Um, Kind of rumored, like Eric Bieniemy, they they interviewed him basically because Deshaun Watson made them. Um, but that situation is just super super ugly because of the fact that Deshaun Watson, it, it really seems like he's going to be out of there. He really wants out of there. He's not answering their phone call, like literally anybody's phone call within the organization. That's never good. Um, and then oh, I almost forgot uh, the Detroit Lions. Uh, they're also having a head coaching vacant head coaching vacancy as well. The guy they're, I think, honed in on is Dan Campbell. I don't think they've officially hired him yet, but I think that's the consensus around the league is the fact that Dan Campbell will be the head coach of the Detroit Lions. Um, And he was on the Saints staff, and he seems like a a solid fit for the Detroit Lions. I don't know a whole lot about him, um, but I've heard good things so far. All right, so... Since that's pretty much over, I'm going to go ahead and get into these divisional round uh, recap of the games. I'm going to start with Green Bay versus the L.A. Rams. This obviously happened on Saturday. Uh, it was the, I guess, it came on right around 3 o'clock. Um, and this game, uh, let me just actually stop right here. I'm proud of myself. I, I'm going to pat myself on the back on this. It's, it's not that impressive. It's picking, you know, it's a 50-50, you know, shot here. But I went 4-0 this weekend on predictions. If you listen to what I said on the podcast last week, uh, I've been, I was 8-2 the last two weeks, or I guess, I guess in totality, the playoffs in general. I've gone 8-2 and and just picking the winners. Uh, it's not that impressive, but I'm going to pat myself on the back with it. So it is what it is. Um, yeah, so Green Bay versus LA Rams. Basically, what this game came down to was, you know, the L.A. Rams, great defense. Their strength on defense is is stifling people in the passing game. Uh, obviously, Aaron Rodgers been red hot with that passing game in Green Bay. Um, Devontae Adams obviously playing out of his mind this year. Uh, Jalen Ramsey gets to shadow Devontae Adams in this one. Um, but at the end of the day, what the Green Bay Packers came into the game doing and they stuck with it was run the ball. I mean, Aaron Jones was playing out of his mind. Um, A.J. Dillon got in there. Jamal Williams got in there. And they all were able to just to pound the rock. And that kept the L.A. Rams really just off balance the entire game. They, they didn't know what to expect, what was coming. And that Green Bay play-action game is the best in all of football. So they're tricking you. They're they're making you know you be super disciplined with your eye, and they made you know the LA Rams pay. Um, it looked like for a while there that game was gonna get really ugly. LA kind of got back into the game a little bit. Um, Jared Goff played a decent game, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, I think I really think that thumb was actually kind of bothering him quite a bit. Um, and by the end of it, like I said, Green Bay was just making too many plays. And they ended up winning the game, as I su- suspected. Um, so, yeah, they're going to go on to the NFC Championship game. All right, so let's go to the next game, Buffalo versus Baltimore. Uh, this game, I thought was going to be the game of the weekend. It ended up being more of a boring game than I was expecting. I thought there was going to be a lot more scoring. It ended up being more of a defensive struggle than I was anticipating. Um, the Buffalo Bills basically were just able to capitalize anytime they got within scoring range and they were able to put points on the board. And that was really the only difference in the game because Baltimore got down there. They kicked a field goal. They missed a couple field goals with the wind being so crazy in that game that night. Uh, the wind was whipping, uh, in Buffalo. And so Justin Tucker missed a couple field goals. So that took some points off the board for Baltimore Ravens and, when they did, I think it was 10 to 3 at one point, uh, Buffalo leading, and the Ravens got down. They were in the red zone, about to score. Lamar Jackson throws a pick six, and it ends, ends up being 17 to 3. And then, literally, two plays later, Lamar Jackson gets knocked on his rear, 
and hits his head on the ground, and he's out with a concussion for the rest of the game, and that pretty much spelled the end of it for the Baltimore Ravens in, in this season. Uh, Buffalo goes on to win, and they're going to be in the AFC Championship game. So next game, Kansas City versus Cleveland. Um, this game, this game started out, and you know I really expected Cleveland, you know, to to play in this game and be competitive, uh, and they actually were. But I really think Kansas City came out, and it, it looked in a in a little, I don't know. I would say after the first quarter, I was thinking this game could potentially get ugly after a while because it looked like Kansas City's defense and give credit to Steve Spagnuolo, that defensive coordinator, just scheming up awesome defensive plays. And they really just stuffed the running attack of the Cleveland Browns. And that's obviously their strength. And so basically their game plan was stop the run and make Baker Mayfield beat us. And Baker Mayfield played a good game. You cannot deny it. He made plays when they were being, you know, needed to be made. And they almost beat the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I will say, though, at that one time when I thought Kansas City was going to, like, kind of run away with it after, basically after the Rashard Higgins, you know, dive for the end zone, gets knocked out of the uh, end zone into the out of bounds, and it basically gives the ball back to Kansas City. It's a touchback on the 20, and they go down. uh, And I think they score on that position, if I'm not mistaken. That was pretty much the turning point of the game. If that never happens, you never know what's going to happen in that game. Um, and then, obviously, a little bit after that, when Kansas City, I thought, was going to start pulling away, that's when Mahomes got hurt. Uh, he gets tackled by Mac Wilson, and his head hits the turf, just like Lamar's did, and he gets a concussion, and he's, he gets up, and he's wobbling. Uh, it doesn't look good. He goes out of the game. Chad Henney comes in, and Chad Henney just kind of – he just kept it steady. Uh, he obviously threw a pretty bad pick there where, like, I think if they would have went down and even just got a field goal on, on that one possession where he threw a pick, they probably would have just sealed the win then and there. Um, but then it got a little bit hairy at the end where, you know, the Browns came back a little bit and Chad Henney basically had to uh, get a – it was a third and 14. And it was a huge, obviously, pivotal point in the game late in the fourth. And he decides to, I think he decided this before even like he snapped the ball. I think he looked at the coverage. It was more than likely man coverage because obviously Chad Henney's in the game, not the starting quarterback, not Mahomes. And they wanted to, you know, make Chad Henney make a play and throw the ball into tight coverage, in man coverage. And if he was going to do it on third and 14, like more power to him. So they were in man coverage. I think before he snapped the ball, he was thinking, I'm running this if I see a lane. And as soon as he snapped the ball, he was he took like a, a very short, you know, drop back and was like, I'm out. Ran left, dives head to first, trying to get the first down. He actually ends up being short. Uh, he's short by like basically a foot and a half or something, maybe even less. And Andy Reid uh, had some big nards on him because he went for it on fourth and one, got the ball to Tyree Hill on a short little route, and that sealed the game. And Kansas City survives this week. We're going to see if Mahomes can play in the AFC Championship game against the Buffalo Bills. I'm going to be extremely disappointed if he can't. Um, but I really hope he can because that's not going to be as good of a game, obviously, if Chad Henney's starting that game. Uh, so let's go to the next one. Uh, Tampa Bay versus New Orleans. This is obviously the night game on Sunday. Tampa Bay comes out, and as, as I suspected, they won the game. Uh, they were able to stay extremely balanced. They were not, you know, feeding into New Orleans crap where they they want Tom Brady to just dominate the game by throwing the ball a ton. That's what happened in the last two uh, games that they played in the regular season, and they got dominated doing that. And so in this game, they made a concerted effort. Uh, Bruce Arians said, we're going to run the ball. And Ronald Jones, even though he was on a bad quad, ran the ball well. Leonard Fournette basically started. He ran the ball really well. They both had over 50 yards rushing. Um, So they just kept them balanced, and Tom Brady made plays when he needed to. Uh, Drew Brees did not have have a very good game. He probably had his worst playoff game probably in the history of his career. Unfortunately, it's going to be his last one, we think, at the very least at this point in time, uh, considering some of the, you know, visuals we saw after the game with him meeting Tom Brady on the field after the game and kind of, you know, giving him a bro hug uh, and being there with his wife and kids on the field maybe one last time. Um, But Drew Brees, as I – 
we kind of was thinking too. I just never really trusted him in that passing game, and Tampa Bay did exactly what they had to do to win that game, which was make Drew Brees throw down the field. Uh, they basically said the same thing that they said, you know, Kansas City said against uh, uh, Cleveland was just we're gonna make Drew Brees beat us. We're gonna make Baker field, Baker Mayfield beat us, and if they can, more power to him. But Drew Brees obviously just does not have. He's just so limited with his like arm strength and and stuff like that that he just made it, it affects your your decision making if you can't make the throws you used to, uh, and if you have to do everything with such timing and anticipation. There are just throws you can't make, and if you try to make them, they're gonna make you pay. And Drew Brees threw multiple picks in this game, which hurt them obviously in the end. And Tampa Bay moves on to win or to go into the NFC Championship game. And obviously Brady just continues to be awesome this late into his career, making another championship game his first NFC win, obviously, because he's been in the AFC his entire career. Um, but that's awesome for him. I mean, he's he's still got I mean, he literally has I mean, the same or as good an arm that he did in his prime in you know New England, and it's just a testament to the way he has conditioned his body and the way that you know he has worked on his mechanics throughout his career. So Tom Brady looks awesome, obviously. Um, so we're gonna see a great matchup in the NFC and the AFC this year. It's it's awesome. I I'm really happy with the way everything kind of went down. Uh, obviously, my team's not in it. I would prefer that, obviously, but the best teams are in the Final Four, and that's all you can really ask in an NFL season. So let's preview these championship weekend games. Um, it's going to be Buffalo versus Kansas City. And as I alluded to before, we don't really know at this point still if Mahomes is going to be able to play in this game. I'm going to be, once again, very disappointed if he can't. Um, it's just not going to be an interesting game to me. I mean, it will, I'm going to watch it. Obviously it'll be interesting still, but just, it wouldn't be, you know, the blockbuster that it should be between Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, two of the better gunslingers in the game at this point in time. Uh, they're both young and just up and coming great quarterbacks. Um, probably both in the, I would say probably in the top five of at the very least this year playing and, if Patrick Mahomes can't play, I think I have to pick the Buffalo Bills to win the game. If Patrick Mahomes does play, I think I'm taking the Kansas City Chiefs. So that's the way I'm kind of going to divvy that up is if, if Buffalo um, or if, if Kansas City's without Mahomes, I got Buffalo. If Kansas City's with Mahomes, I got uh, Kansas City. Um, there's not really a whole lot I can – I mean – I could do a little bit of deep dive here, but I think it's really just going to come down because I think they're both a very similar type team where it, they're pretty you know, offensive centric at this point in time. Definitely Kansas City. I mean, but Kansas City's defense plays pretty well, um, and so does Buffalo's at times. Uh, and they, I feel like they have the ability to lock down whenever they need to. Um, and I, th- I think they're they're pretty good mirror images of each other, especially just offensively where they have weapons. Um, and they have a great quarterback, um, but yeah, I, that's just how I'm picking those two two game or that game in general. Just it's based on the de- this not the decision, but if Patrick Mahomes can clear the concussion protocol in that game, and he's also dealing with I think a toe issue as well. You saw him limping a little bit in that game before he even went out with the concussion. Uh, so that's gonna be interesting to see. So the next game obviously is gonna be the NFC Championship game, Green Bay versus Tampa Bay. Uh, the two goats of the NFL when it comes to quarterbacking. Um, I personally am a Aaron Rodgers guy. I think he's the greatest quarterback to have ever done it so far. I think Patrick Mahomes has a, a chance to kind of overtake Aaron Rodgers as, as that. Um, I am in the minority when it comes to that, considering everybody else kind of – basically the consensus is Tom Brady's the greatest of all time. I think there's a way to distinguish between the two. It's it's a long, drawn-out like debate – I'm not going to go into it right now, but I will say this is going to be a very fun matchup. It happened in the regular season. Um, in that game, Green Bay came out, scored a touchdown pretty quickly, and at that point you think, you know, this this could be you know a pretty good game here. And then all of a sudden, Tampa Bay just stomps on them. Um, and then early, in this week already, Devin White comes out and says, uh, like, quote, something along the lines of, 
Uh, the Green Bay Packers didn't even deserve to be on the same field as us on that day in the regular season when they played and they beat the crap out of them. So already a little bit of bulletin board material for the Green Bay Packers going into this NFC Championship game. I don't think they need any more of a chip on their shoulder right now. Aaron Rodgers wears all of the chips on his shoulders um, because he just loves that. I think that's just what motivates him. That's what you know lights a fire under his rear. So Aaron Rodgers versus Tom Brady, you can't really ask for a better matchup in an NFC Championship game. That's weird to say, saying NFC Championship game because of Tom Brady being in the NFC at this point, but... That's going to be a, such a fun game, man. And I think it really is going to come down to, and it's it's both teams, man. Just kind of like I was saying with in the AFC Championship where Buffalo and um, Kansas City are, are almost mirror images of themselves uh, or of each other. I think Tampa Bay and Green Bay are mirror images of themselves as well because I think both teams, if they aren't allowed or aren't able to stay balanced with the run pass, um, it can get ugly for one of the two teams. Um, I do have more faith right now in the way that the Green Bay Packers have played in the last pretty much all season, but especially the last few weeks of the season. I mean, and Tampa Bay's played obviously great the last few weeks of the season as well, but I just think consistently Green Bay has played better. Um, and I just have more faith in Aaron Rodgers making more plays than Tom Brady right now. And that's really what it comes down to. So I really would prefer in the Super Bowl matchup, Kansas City versus Green Bay. Been saying it for weeks on end. That's the game I want to watch. That's Patrick Mahomes, the guy that's probably going to overtake, in my opinion, Aaron Rodgers, the greatest to do it at the quarterback position in the NFL history. Um, so that would be the matchup I would prefer. I'm not going to be mad if Buffalo gets in and beats, or in Buffalo gets in and play the Green Bay Packers or Tampa Bay or vice versa, whatever the com- combination, I won't mind it whatsoever. I I will be a little bit upset if it's Buffalo versus Tampa Bay. That would be a little bit more boring to me. I would then pull for um, Buffalo at that point. I just there's something about Josh Allen that I, that I just kind of wrap my arms around. Um, that team's a, a special team. Bills obviously haven't won a Super Bowl. That would be awesome for them you know just as a fan base um as an eagles fan i can wholeheartedly say it it was one of the probably the best day of my life when the eagles won the super bowl so i just i would always want that to happen for someone else especially uh you know a franchise that has yet to do it so that's probably what i'd go there um if, if i'm telling you if it's Kansas City versus Green Bay in the Super Bowl. I think I'm pulling for Green Bay just to kind of solidify that legacy of um, Aaron Rodgers. Um, but if Mahomes wins his second ring, I'm not going to be mad whatsoever. Um, so, yeah, that's just kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, that pretty much does it for the podcast. I appreciate everybody listening. Um, if you would, please you know, subscribe to the channel, like the channel, share it if you can. Um, follow us on the social media platforms at iTest Takes on Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok. Shout out to my producer, Weston Barnhart. He's the man, continues to do a great job for me. And we'll see you guys next week. See ya.